You've been spinning fine threads of white wool since early this morning, but every time you glance down at the wool basket, there seems to be more left to do, not less. Your fingers are sore. You shift your weight in the stiff, wooden chair and look across at your sister-in-law. Like you, she holds in her left hand a distaff, a stick with unspun wool wrapped round it to keep the fibres from tangling. With her right hand, she steadily draws down the fibres and lets the weight of the whirling spindle below twist it into thread. She's almost finished the wool in her basket. You call for another basketful from your daughters in the corner, where they're picking dirt out of the next load of wool. At least, that's what they're supposed to be doing. There is rather more giggling and rather less wool cleaning happening than you'd hoped. Your younger daughter is quiet and careful. She'll make a good wife one day. But your elder daughter, coming up fifteen, has a mischievous streak. Yesterday the girls were sent to fetch some olive oil from the storeroom, and she locked her little sister in as a prank. You told her off, but it was pretty funny. That said, she's due to be married this winter, and you hope she'll grow up quickly after that. It's 465 BC in Athens. Your city is rising to prominence after a series of victories over the terrifying Persian army, the most recent just last year. As you and your community recover from the trauma of the Persian Wars, your city's growing navy is building control over the Aegean islands, who are grateful for defence against Persian sea power. At home in Athens, the burgeoning empire has filled the markets with a great variety of affordable luxuries you can send the slave girl out to buy, launched a new fashion for sleeved garments in the Persian style, and brought the possibility of making a bit of extra money weaving sailcloth for the expanding fleet. There are voices on the other side of the courtyard, and the small, thin slave girl appears at the door in her dirty tunic. Did you get it? you ask. She presents you with the pot. It's just about small enough to hold in one hand with the fingers spread wide, but it sits more safely in both your hands together. It's a good size for holding earrings, hairpins, face powder. The squat cylindrical shape curves in and then out again, like a woman's waist. The ceramic is painted with a black glaze, smooth under your work-worn fingertips. The painter has created the patterns and images by leaving them unpainted, so they shine out in the bright orange of the clay. Around the black lid is an orange floral border, around the black base, square orange spirals. Between the borders is a little scene. The painter has gone round the shapes of five women. He has left their clothes and bodies in orange, but picked out the details of the fabrics and the faces with a fine black brush. You pass it to your sister-in-law. Look, she sees it too, and giggles. The fourth woman on the pot is not spinning. She's not working at all. She's juggling. The painted woman leans back on her stool to make space for three flying balls, stretches out her arms to throw and catch them, and tilts up her head to watch them loop through the air. Opposite her, another woman watches, keeping her own arms tightly wrapped in her shawl. She nervously raises a bent finger to her mouth. What is it? Your eldest daughter cries. Be quiet, you tell her. It's a surprise. You meet your sister-in-law's eye and smile. The cosmetics pot is a gift for your daughter's betrothal ceremony, at which her father will give her to her new husband. You hope the picture will remind her that there's always fun to be had amidst her daily tasks, and you hope it'll remind her of you while she settles into a strange new home. Her husband-to-be is in his early thirties, twice her age, like your husband was when he married you, like his brother was when he married your sister-in-law. It's important that girls from propertied families like yours marry young to establish an alliance and produce an heir as soon as possible, and to keep them out of trouble. Fifteen is a good age for a girl to be married, but men should be older, more experienced, more established. The words of the betrothal will remind the couple that marriage is for producing legitimate children. They will marry in the winter. There'll be a torch-lit procession from her house to his, and he'll give a feast for his friends and relatives. The following winter, she will give birth to a little daughter of her own, and die a few days later. You will bury the pot beside her in her grave. This pot now sits in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, 
in the Greek World Gallery on the ground floor. I'm Catherine Backler. I'm a postdoctoral researcher working on classical Athenian women, and I'd like to tell you a bit more about this pot. It's called a pyxis. Ancient Greek women used them to hold makeup and small items like rings, or incense for religious rites. Over the years, the pot has been broken and pieced back together, and the edges are chipped, but you can still see the design clearly with the painted women. The story you've just heard is imagined, but it's based on real details of what the lives of women and girls were like in 5th century BC Athens. And a real person, or real people, did buy and use this pot. How would those people have felt about a woman juggling? Classical Athens prized self-control in women, but misogynistic portrayals in the literature of the time claim it was rare. Different viewers might have judged the juggling inappropriate frivolity or harmless amusement, but presumably the person who bought this pot liked the picture. Perhaps a woman in Athens used it to keep her things in. Did she choose it for herself, or was it a gift? What did she like about it? Did it make her laugh? Did the woman juggling remind her of herself, or of another woman she knew? Gifts are heavily invested with emotion. Affection between giver and receiver, anticipation, expectation, gratitude, nervousness about whether the receiver will like the gift, satisfaction in choosing a gift that goes down well. They also remind us of the occasion on which they were given, and the memories and emotions associated with that. If gifts later end up in museum cabinets, they might at first glance look emotionless, but they still carry the stories of emotions they once evoked. Women in 5th century Athens, where the pot was painted, spent a lot of time working together at home, particularly doing labour-intensive textile work, like spinning and weaving. Lots of Athenian pots show women doing textile work together. There are some in the same cabinet as this pot. But the depiction of a woman juggling here is extremely unusual. She has the same clothes and elegantly done up hair as the others on the pot, so it's unlikely she's supposed to represent an enslaved woman acting as an entertainer. What's going on? We don't know for certain, but it may simply be that she's having fun. Women must have found ways to stave off the boredom of long hours of repetitive work and to keep themselves and each other entertained. In the Acropolis Museum in Athens, there's a painted clay tablet which was dedicated to the goddess Athena. It shows a woman at work, probably some kind of textile work, while a little girl plays behind her, possibly with a ball of wool. As the city's name suggests, Athena was the patron deity of Athens. She was also patron of war and of craft work, particularly textile work. The fact that textile work had a divine patron indicates how important it was to ancient Greek life, which must in turn have given women a sense of their own importance in carrying it out. A couple of ancient Greek writers mention girls playing ball games. Every year, two or four little girls were chosen to serve Athena on the Acropolis, helping to weave a dress for her statue to be presented at her annual festival. The author Plutarch, writing in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, mentions that these girls had a court on the Acropolis for ball games. At one point in Homer's poem The Odyssey, which was probably composed in the 8th century BC, Odysseus washes up on an island where he finds a princess and her companions playing ball while they wait for the clothes they've been washing to dry. Before he arrived, they'd been making a game of the washing itself competing to see who could do it fastest. As on this pot, there could be moments of fun and pleasure amidst the work, which built affectionate relationships between the girls and women involved. In ancient Greece, almost all women, rich and poor, did textile work, cleaning the wool, combing the fibres straight, spinning the fibres into thread, weaving them into cloth to make clothes and sheets, and washing the finished products when necessary. In the Iliad and Odyssey, enslaved women spin and weave, but so do queens like Helen of Troy and Penelope, the wife of Odysseus. For enslaved women, this arduous work was forced. For women of high status, though, the work brought prestige. Women could demonstrate their talents, 
developed over years of practice by producing elaborate garments which attracted attention and praise. Poorer women were probably more concerned with making ends meet than with making eye-catching garments, but we do have an inscribed dedication from 4th century BC Athens in which a woman who earned money through textile work declares her pride in the skills of her hands. Textile work also had connotations of sexual virtue. The idea was that a faithful wife kept herself occupied and away from temptation. A man whose wife was always at her work could trust her. Spinning and weaving could be a source of pride then, but also of anxiety. They were bound up with the question of what it meant to be a good woman. Is this the anxiety we imagine in the woman on the pot with her hand in front of her mouth, watching the woman who isn't working? She isn't working either. Is she anxious about that? It can be hard to read emotions from a picture, especially when that picture was produced in a culture which had different values, ideas and modes of expression to ours. To us, the faces of the painted women look emotionless. Their gestures are more eloquent. A bent finger raised to the mouth seems to indicate anxiety, though it could be attentiveness, astonishment, alarm, surprise, even delight. The pot's unknowability shapes our own emotional engagement with it. While the emotions of its Athenian users were grounded in their knowledge of the pot, why they chose it, who owned it and how they came to own it, what it was used for, its status as a familiar object, the emotions it evokes in us are shaped by the fact that there are things we don't and can't know about it. This might make us curious, frustrated, sad. Thousands of years have passed, and some things are lost forever. We relate to the pot differently to its original users, but the emotions it evokes in us as a museum object are an important part of its story. Most Athenian painted pots in museums and collections come from graves. Pots survive from graves because they were buried underground and weren't smashed beyond recognition over time. Though some people in classical Athens were cremated, including usually the war dead, most were buried. Families might bury a few small items with them. Pots, mirrors, toys for a dead child. In a number of cases, women were buried with a pyxis. In the 5th century, some painted pots from graves show images of death ritual or of gods associated with the underworld, but others show scenes from daily life. These pots might have been used by the dead person in their lifetime, or they might have been purchased specifically to go in the grave. This pot comes from Athens, but the context in which it was found, a grave, a house, a temple, wasn't recorded. If it had been, we'd know more about how it was used and the emotions associated with it. If this pot did end up in a woman's grave, it carries a story of grief. I think a woman's bereaved family might have chosen to bury it with her as a favourite possession. It reminded them of her. A funny scene for a sad occasion. The humour is bittersweet. What do you think the story behind the pot might be? Does the juggling woman remind you of anyone?